Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our last seminar of season three. Um, so I'll just I'll just share my screen. Um, so here, here we are. Um, just to remind everyone, you you all probably know this, but you can go and see the previous seminars on the MNR webpage. And there's no registration links because this is the last one, but we'll start soon setting things up for season four. Um, we're, we're searching for people and ideas and topics for season four. And we have the MNR team of, uh, oh, sorry, I miss Sasha. Alan, Juliana, Lindsay, Max, Sasha, and Stefan. Um, so today, though, we have an open mic, and we did this uh, last year, and it worked quite well. And we'll just, uh, people can chat about anything they like. And uh, the one comment, I, I, do, I took this photograph from the first EM workshop I went to in 1976, and there's me, stood next to Jane Seek, and uh, Fournier on, on, my, on my right. And I asked chat GPT what the collective noun is for MT specialists, and I was answered a flux. So we're a flux of MT specialists. So today I've, I've, I've got a few topics, but please, this is very open. Um, anyone will discuss absolutely anything. And I think the important point I want to make, particularly for the younger members here, is that there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? So please feel free to ask a question, uh, put it in the chat, or, or just speak. There might be stupid answers, but there's no such thing as a stupid question. So just some topics I've collected. Uh, not, I didn't get a lot of uh, topics. Um, phase roll out a quadrant, which is becoming something that is, is becoming more and more important. Anisotropy, um, sensitivity analysis of final 3D models and realistic geological models. Okay. Uh, I'll just stop the share there before I run into the very first topic, just to see, um, so everyone can see everybody else. Please, if you want to, turn on your camera um, so we can all see you. We have uh, 17 participants. And then, uh, has anybody got anything that they would like us to discuss other than what I just quickly showed? Or should, should we just start with the first topic? And uh, you see, we have some of the MNR team here, Lindsay and, and, and Stefan, and Max might be coming in if, if he can. Um, okay, all right, then let's go back to the first topic, which is phase rollout of quadrant. Um, I first bumped into this <clears throat> in a survey that we did in southeastern British Columbia, and this was the survey in 1987, collected by Phoenix Geophysics for us on contract. Um, and the, the date is absolutely wonderful, still wonderful, even though it was that vintage equipment. And we recorded a bunch of sites in southeastern British Columbia over the Purcell Anticlinorium and we also went over this batholith, the Jurassic batholith, 50 kilometers wide, 150 kilometers long. And we had a, a few empty sites on it. And um, every single site on the batholith shows the, the YX phase going out of quadrant, starting from about one second onwards. And none of the sites off the bath list do. Um, and I followed this up in 1988 with a, an EMAP survey. This was a, because it was done by an American company, AET at the time, this was a thousand foot long dipoles. And we went basically from off the bath list onto the bath list. And the moment we stepped on the bath list, we saw this phase roll out a quadrant effect, this phase going out quadrant. Now, <clears throat> I'm looking more and more at uh, mining scale data these days, and I'm, I'm seeing this effect more and more in our data. And we're struggling to, 
to understand it and explain it. So I just thought I'd open, open with that uh, topic. And other people can speak now, because <laughs> it's... I'll jump in then with a question. I don't know, Alan or anybody else. Do you have any sort of physical intuition? If like, do you have pictures in your head of currents or magnetic fields in this case? Or if not, are there things that you think would be insightful to perhaps simulate and look at? I think you make a very important point there, Lindsay. And the point being that we MT people, we often look at the ratios of fields, the over H. And I think we get more physical insight when we look at the field responses. We, can, we don't measure the field responses, but when we, when we do modeling, we should be looking at the electric fields and the magnetic fields. Um, now, I was, I was a, the first time I was really convinced about the existence of PROC and it wasn't just, a, you know, I hate to say this, Jan, it wasn't just an instrumentation problem with your equipment whenever we were on a battle. <laughs> 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 the first time I was convinced of a decent explanation of this was a, a paper I reviewed in 2003 by uh, uh, Heiser and Paus. Um, and they had some data in Spain where they had a profile of sites and one bunch of sites had phase rollout of quadrants. And they were able to model this in 2D with uh, two levels of anisotropy. They, they knew from the local geology that there was a lot of dikes going through this particular area where they saw the prop. And so they had a particular strike direction in the upper crust, in the uppermost crust. And then if they, if they made the lower crust anisotropic, so they had two, two layers of anisotropy, they got phases rolling out a quadrant exactly where they needed them. And so this, this makes me wonder whether, leading on to the next topic, whether in fact we really do need to consider anisotropy seriously. Uh, may I say something? I sure, of here. course, of course. Yeah. Uh, actually, we have been working in the Himalaya. Uh, so some of the Eastern Himalayan side on the fault, major thrust faults, like main central thrust. When we cross this fault, we have obtained this behavior, phase of a quadrant. And that was the Eastern part of the Himalaya. A similar behavior we obtained on similar kind of tectonic setting on the Western Himalaya also. So we see a lot of uh, the sites which uh, fall on, uh, around this uh, main central thrust, they encounter these kind of problems. Uh, one of the things which uh, we tried to interpret was in terms of anastropy, this high and bows. And also we also saw some papers which tried to put a specific geometry of 3D conductors, uh, like putting a small conductor at the side of a bigger conductor and try to explain these things. How do we really differentiate what could be the probable thing causing this uh, out of phase, whether it's a special configuration or whether it's an isotropy. And the data quality especially was very good. Uh, a similar kind of curve, uh, which were acquired in very, very isolated area. And this we have obtained very close to main central thrust. Other thing we observed when we analyzed this data was the ratio of vertical magnetic field to horizontal field was very large at these sites. Okay. Uh -huh. hmm. So my, my, my question to the members here is that, can we really differentiate between anastropy and uh, special geometries to explain this out of phase quadrant? Out of yeah. Well, I, I uh, when I was in uh, China a few three years ago, I actually took these data with me, and uh, together with Hao Dong, uh, we we threw them into Modi M. Okay. And uh, Modi M uh, doesn't have galvanic distortion in it. It's just uh, isotropic conductivity. There's no galvanic, and 
And it gave us a model back that started to reproduce the effect. But the model was, was of, a, of a thin conducting structure that was kind of like a corkscrew. It was, it was completely, complete geological nonsense. So the program was, was trying to explain this data and it found a model at fit, but the model made no sense geologically. And I think we do have to, I think we have to be careful with that because we are, you know, our, our codes are limited, right? Um, and I guess the other thing that interests me is what you just said about the vertical magnetic field, because I, some of the data I've been looking at, we, we see at high frequencies, both magnetic and electric uh, distortion effects. Okay. What we observed was where this phase started going out of quadrant, the vertical ratio of vertical to horizontal became large. This we observed at our oh, site. Oh, yeah. Can Did I jump you in and try it? Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry, can I jump in and make a comment? Absolutely. Sure. Um, yeah, so first of all, I wanted to mention that um, those out of quadrant phases in Southeast BC, they seem to go up all along the Rocky Mountain Trench as well, not just in that specific oh, area. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so some of the work that like Martin Unsworth's group has done on the Rocky Mountain Trench sees out of quadrant phases further north as well along the Rocky Mountain Trench. And I mean, when you're, I forget who was saying it, but when you're talking about the large vertical magnetic fields, it sounds kind of like coast effect and you get out of quadrant phases with extreme coast effect too, I've seen in, in like central Chile, for example, if you have a huge contrast between the resistive coast mountains and the conductive oceans. So yeah, I don't know if it necessarily has to be anisotropy, it could be other kind of configurations that that lead to that too so not really a question but just a comment i guess uh, there's a little bit of literature out there um that explains these phases without an isotropy right and i might just share my screen because i did take those up oh you disabled it uh, oh yeah just a minute sorry let me turn it on Screen share, advanced sharing options, all participants. Thanks. Um, okay. Yep, thanks for that. Let's see if I... <clears throat> so there's, there's a couple of examples. Uh, there was one by Ishihara 2009. Right, yeah, yeah. That looked at um, so I, I think my understanding is a phases out of quadrant happens in in areas where you have um, really strong conductance that is of different geometry or differing geometry that basically guides the currents in such a way that it almost doesn't matter what your polarizing field is you know the the, the source orientation always goes into that structure because it is so strong. So here's an example, for example, where you have a regional conductor that's, that's pretty conductive, 4.3 ohmmeters, and then you have a local conductor. And what they showed is sort of in that knee is where you get phases out of quadrant. So it's a bit of what Darcy just said, you know, when you have the coast is, is one really strong conductor next to a resistor, and then all you need is just some fault. There's almost as a, at a right angle to it that causes that. So that, that's an explanation. Of get phase out of quadrant. Um, I had a publication, and that's actually based on some work by Ucho Beckman, which is very similar to the baffle Ellen that you showed. So this is some survey that we did in 2005 across Oman, uh, across the overlight sequence. And there's sort of an, a domal structure. So the way you want to look at this is this sort of box in the middle is resistive. And then you have sort of outgoing from that like sort of slightly to form conductive structure. And if you have that, it can either be a block that's open in the middle, or you have a domal structure that goes out. That causes, or that gives you phases out of quadrant. And this is from a forward model here, uh, when you are inside of it. So it's kind of what you just said with the baffle lip. Mm. Um, 
you know, you're sitting on the resistive bed, but you see a conductor that's circular around you. I think that's enough uh, enough of a condition to give you phases out of 90 degrees. Um, if you had, I think, and I such be a, this, the story, I guess what Wiebke Heiser has shown is that you have two different really strong orientations of uh, conductance that are preferentially aligned and they just draw those currents into no matter what the orientation of the of the um, source field is or the source polarization, I, I should say. Um, just a comment, but that's that's a few scenarios, but I think they all have the same, they share the same idea that you have, you have to have really strong conductors and a strong resistivity contrast, and then they are at sort of oblique angles. Yeah, we don't really have that for the Nelson Basilis. The one thing we do have, there was a paper published just a couple of years ago that said that actually on the, um, uh, some, some geologists mapped right on the edges of the Bathlith, a very thin uh, graphite layer. And so if, if this Bathlith has got this graphite layer underneath it, you can imagine this sort of uh, ovoid shaped graphite layer. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether, whether that could do it. But we, what we really need is for Phoenix to go back to, you're listening, Jan, need you to go back to, <laughs> to BC and do more measurements because we've only got the one profile. We, we can't really do 3D. Yeah, that would be a little bit expensive, but uh, we can consider this. <laughs> Actually, we did a 3D inversion of one profile. And it gave uh, some additional information uh, because the main target was of the line which was given to us. So uh, Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm hoping to have a better understanding of this proc effect in time for uh, Lindsay's uh, 3D EM workshop. If you want to make a small advertisement for that, Lindsay, now's your, now's the time. <laughs> Thanks, Alan, nice cue. Um, yeah, so we'll be holding the um, 3D EM symposium here in Vancouver, that'll be in November. I think it's the 12th to the 14th. It's a, a Monday to a Wednesday. Um, we've put out a save the date and we should be getting the website and the call for abstracts out uh, very, very soon. So we'll circulate that on empty net and, um, but feel free to contact me in the meantime, if you've got any questions about that. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I do have a stupid question. Alan, you said there were there were no stupid questions, so, so I, I mean, yeah, well, I'll make an exception for you, Jan. Oh, yeah, thanks, Alan. <laughs> so, what do you guys do when you're facing a proc in your data? I mean, okay, I understand that now we can sort of model the proc effect, but when it comes to inversions, what do you guys do? Do you just delete the low frequencies, ignore that part, or are you trying to bring it something else in your that bring it something else in your data set? to try to better model that and stitch it to the high frequency inverted response? What do you do? Well, I, up, up until I read that uh, paper by Heiser and Paus from 19, uh, from 2004, that's what I did in, in 2D mm -hmm. because we only had an isotropic 2D codes and in 2D, you, isotropic 2D, you cannot get phases out of quadrant. Um, except for a very minor amount in a, in a strong contrast situation. Um, so yeah, that's what we did. And that, that really, for me, was a bit of a revelation. That paper was a, uh, it was a wonderful paper for really emphasizing the fact that there is, there's some aspects to our data that, that we really need to include in order to interpret data, data properly. Because, because, yeah, when we have like uh, quite a few data sets with this that have been passed to us by our clients or that we acquired, uh, and we were never presented with uh, some sort of solution that worked consistently. Um, so 
we decided to ignore this data because we couldn't handle them. Uh, I'm pretty sure some of these data are public by now, they're old. Um, but we, yeah, we did collect it quite a lot in Canada, especially every time there's a mining boom in Canada, the proc issue is, uh, yeah, yeah. is, uh, is yeah. coming up yeah. because of what Darcy and Stefan said, uh, the contrast in the large contrast in resistivity and productivity yeah. Yeah, it seems to correlate with uh, this proc effect. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, can, we, can't, we can't talk too much, Jan, about some data that you and I are looking at right now. But um, though we can say generally that those data may be showing magnetic distortion effects as well as electric distortion effects. And that's what uh, Alan Chave and I looked at for the BC87 data set, but it, it wasn't satisfactory what we did. But I think sometimes uh, you, you can get very strong magnetic dose distortion effects. Can I ask two questions kind of related? Is um, I guess the first question, Alan, is um, how how are you coming to that conclusion or what sorts of things are you looking at to pin down and say, oh, I think this is magnetic distortion effects. And I guess the, the other question is perhaps picking up on Jan's comment. Are there data sets that you think are public at this point that, you know, we would be useful for this community to pick up and, and try and dig our teeth into? Well, to answer your first question, um... I think I can safely say that one, one thing that we, uh, Jan is looking at closely for some data that was recently acquired, the, the, tipper, the, the tipper transfer function is, is almost zero at one kilohertz and then increases with increasing frequency and becomes quite large at 10 kilohertz. So my, my initial thought was there was something wrong with the calibration files and, and Jan's looking into this, but it, well, some of the sites where, where this effect occurs, we're also seeing quite strong uh, proc. Hmm. Yeah, actually, Alan, I was talking about vintage data. I'm not talking about current data and yeah, no, I know, I know, I know, yeah, yeah. I know. And I do, I think I look into it, Lindsay, say that I think we have a data set, a large data set of about 200 sites that was acquired for about two by, uh, by us. And it was for, I don't know, Nwinsco or Extrada, one of those two mining companies that does not exist anymore. And these data are definitely like, uh, uh we can definitely share this data now finding this data is a challenge <laughs> i don't know where they are at phoenix but we did i mean there was a large conductor at uh, uh something like 10 hertz 100 hertz or 10 hertz it was acquired in ontario northern ontario in the rainy river um mm. I, i'll see if i can uh, share that um if i can find it first there was quite a few examples of that there was a nice 3d grid acquired in 2004 or something Yeah, that, uh, that data set I just spoke about, uh, Lindsay, is, is one that uh, you also will know about. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, certainly, Jan, if we could, if we could get a publicly available, the BC87 is, is limited because it's only a few sites. It'd be much better to have a 3D grid. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's definitely some Australian data, so if you jump on Geoscience Australia's website or Geological Survey of South Australia, where I am, um, there's lots of publicly available data. Um, I can point you to some of it. So, but we definitely have long period broadband data where phases go out of quadrant. We have hundreds to thousands of sites, so there are some other quadrants in there. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. They're real pain. <laughs> okay, I've forgotten your second question, Lindsay. 
Uh, that the second question was about data. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, address yeah. both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I might, if, if it's okay, Alan. Sure, sure, sure. I, I might, I might ask a question if, if, because I've seen it in Australia, if other people have seen phases below zero, so the other quadrant, if that, <laughs> that occurs sometimes. Do you see that as well? I've so seen, what? yeah, I've seen in some of the data that, uh, <coughs> that, that Jan's looking at for us, I've seen the phases at high frequencies. Is this going? Um, at high frequencies, the phases are dropping below zero. And, by uh, just a few degrees, so I mean? and then by just a few degrees, and they come back up. No, they don't come back up. They, they, they're they're okay at one kilohertz, and then as they go towards ten kilohertz, they go below zero. Oh, at that end. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all. So, what what I'm seeing is um, at really high frequencies, so AMT data. You know, it's it's a completely normal looking response then. One of the phases dips just below zero degrees, maybe in minus five, minus four, sometimes minus eight. Um, and then it comes back up and it's sort of your long period frequency band, um, you know, or, or long period band, it, it looks normal. So it's around about 0.1 seconds or 10 hertz quite often is the sort of dip. I wonder if other people see that too. Mm -hmm. May I say something? Yeah. Sure, sure, please. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, actually, we have seen some of this data, especially when there's a surface conducting layer uh, overlying a very, very highly resistive genetic nicest uh, mass. There, mm. the phase goes down and this skirts past zero and comes back, uh, yeah. but not too much into the negative side. But it does yeah. happen in some of our data, my data sets. Uh, especially when the contrast is very high and underlying yeah. body is highly resistive. Yeah. You have observed. Yeah. So what, what you're thinking that might be the explanation of that, Stefan? Is it, uh, you, you've got sediments, you're going into basement, you've got a dipping yeah. phase curve, rising apparent resistivity curve. Yeah, well, about 10 years ago, Kate Selway, Eric Key and I looked into this because we, we had a data, or Kate had a data set that was really marked by it. It was a small scale data set. And in our case, at least what turned out was when you measure on sediments, and I think it's what RJ just said, when, when you have a, a really strong resistor nearby, but you don't measure on top of it, but it's, it's nearby. What seems to happen is that the diffusing field that goes into the sediments and dissipates it senses to conduct the resistor to the side and because it's so easy to flow for currents through a resistor, they literally turn around and come back up on the resistive side. So you get energy not diffusing downwards the way it should be, which is you're giving your normal yeah, yeah, in quadrant yeah. phase, but it's, it's so sort of slightly coming back up and it just is enough if the contrast is really strong and it has to be, it has to be on the order of three or four orders of magnitude. Uh, then you get these phases that are below zero degrees. And apparently the, I don't do marine MT, but the effect is much, much stronger if you are measuring, you know, at a trench near, 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 um, near continent, you get these phases that are dipping really quite, you know, tens of degrees below zero. Hmm. But I think that that's just sort of physically what's, what's happening there. But I'm just wondering how, how often that occurs really. Yeah, I was uh, sorry. I was just going to say I'm I'm trying to dig up this paper by Kerry Key because there's a great paper by Kerry Key that shows exactly what you're describing. In 2011 like, or something coming yeah. up, coming up um, vertically rather than going down vertically. So I'll I'll share it if I can find it, but I can't find it right now. Good. I guess one 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 question, uh, Stefan, if you can remember, was you with the apparent resistivity was the gradient greater than one? I think it has to be yes. yes. So when when I see in the data, it is it is causal because it is an inductive effect. Uh, it happens in the TE mode uh, in in two D. So that if if you look up Selway twenty twelve, 
uh, we, we 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 did look. We show the data set um, and the face tensors, you know, as you as you measure them, um, and then Carrie did a forward model of of how you can explain that. So it's inductive. So that means you're right. Your apparent resistivity on a log log scale goes up higher than forty five degrees, and your face is just below zero. Yep. And I have seen it since in other data sets because in Australia you have sediments everywhere, but you do have outcrop every now and then. So yeah, I just wonder if you see that in you know Canada and or in other parts as well. There's a chat over there. Yeah. Well, we don't we we don't have the uh, <laughs> most place of Canada. We don't have a hundred meters of conducting goop on top of like, that. Like a you. Yeah, we had a glaciation, you know. So. <laughs> um. Yeah, the interesting thing is to, instead of looking at a Paris dividend phase, look at the real and imaginary parts. And there's there's been a few papers published recently by Zorin about uh, the Hilbert transform relationship in MT uh, generalized. We know we know in MT we have from Peter Weidel, we've, we know formally that the um, in the 1D case and in TM in 2D, we have a minimum phase transfer function. And so the amplitude and phase form a Hilbert transform pair. But backing off from that, in, a, in the general case, a real, uh, realizable transfer function should be Hilbert transformable, right? So the real and imaginary part should form a Hilbert transform pair. And there's been some a lot of discussion about this in the past, but the papers by Zorin on, on hundreds of data from, yeah, there you are. Maybe you should tell us about those. Yeah, the minute of glory. Uh, actually, actually, I think, it, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, great. So, uh, I mean, I think that I can add something about this uh, phase rolling out of quadrant phenomena though. Uh, can I share the, yes, I guess, <laughs> I guess I can. So yeah, I had the recent, recent paper on about this dispersion relations thing, and it's not about phase rolling out of quadrant, but as you may, as you may see that it, it's very, very close to it. So uh, uh, speaking about the physics, the physics of this, because I, I tried to find as, as many models showing the Brock phenomenon as I could and to figure out some some new ones. So as far as I understand it, so the physics is quite simple. So there are two two ways of uh, these phases uh, rolling out a quadrant. So the first one is caused by the electric field distortion, uh, which is uh, uh, manifested in that the electric field is has a 180 degrees flip. On some uh, frequency, and uh, the and Stefan already showed this paper of Ichihara and Mogi. I think that's the the best the best uh, example and the easiest to understand. So that uh, this L form very simple model, and they show that if if the conductor is not uh, continuous, there is no no phase flip because because the the original current flows from the right to left, and in this, if you see my mouse, do you see it? So in, in, in this in this part of this uh, model, the electric field is reversed. So the phase rolling out of quadrant happens only in the <laughs> places where the electric field reverses its direction on some uh, on some frequency or period. And there is another type where the magnetic field reverses its direction, and that's what Stefan told. If you see the phase rolling out downwards, this is called by the magnetic field phase reversal. And if it's uh, rolling out upwards, this is called by the electric field reversal. And we showed it in many, many, in many models so with anisotropy. They are they always show these electric field uh, reversals and uh, some other uh, L form 
U form, they show electric field reversals, but we, you can uh, you can make some 2D model with topography, and probably this one is close to what uh, Ajay, I think, said. So if you have then elevated conductor, conducting layer over the resistive uh, basement, and you measure somewhere quite low enough. So if you are on the surface, you will see something what Stefan saw, slight uh, rolling down and then coming back. But if you will measure it below the conducting body, you will see the complete phase rolling out of feather and uh, mm. downwards. Mm. And that's what we see on the ocean bottom, but we it's very difficult to find it, to encounter it on the, in, on the land uh, because it's kind of on geological model. Maybe, I don't know, we never, we never encountered it in real life, maybe in, in Himalaya, I don't know. Uh, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and yeah, and it, turning back to this uh, uh, validity of the dispersion relations and all that phases rolling out of whether and the relations between phase and amplitude they are violated, but uh, relations between real and imaginary parts they always uh, hold, provided that the distortion is an electric field, and uh, we uh, we used all our field empty data and we have quite a lot in West, like 100,000 uh, site, trying to find these uh, uh, data where the magnetic field is distorted, not on the ocean bottom because it's quite often there, but on the land and we didn't find it. So that, that means that in real empty data uh, measured on land, uh, all components, all the impedance tensors and the cheaper tensors, they always uh, should have the real to imaginary dispersion relations uh, Valid, and that's kind of thing that we can use to check the data consistency and probe data quality. Yeah, I mean, one one very powerful tool in in MT that I use a lot is um, Parker and Booker's Row Plus. Uh, but that's only valid when the amplitude and phase are a Hilbert transform pair, but. You're, you're doing this for the real and imaginary parts. Can you tell me, if you don't mind, a technical question? Because I've I've tried to I've tried to do this, and it, it's not easy with a logarithmically spaced data set to take a, a Fourier transform and, and take the inverse in order to try and uh, how do you do it? We don't actually do it a lot. We still, uh, but for say for Tipper, yeah, for Tipper, we always uh, use the Hilbert transform, and uh, the, the, there are a couple of, uh, not a couple, there maybe dozens of different uh, equations and formula of how to calculate it from from another, and mo many of them are given in this paper, and so you, you can try different. And I know also there is a very recent uh, approach made by uh made in turkey uh i don't remember uh, shown by someone from the turkey colleagues and they show how they calculate Hilbert transform in some kind of different way. Cool. maybe yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, yeah he, you, you can, he published Erhan, that Erhan can say. yeah he published that after your paper he inspired from your work and he applied it to uh frequency normalized impedance function. So, uh, and for unequally sampled uh, data, I guess, I don't remember which journal was it, probably geophysics. And he's also sharing the code. He sent me, but I couldn't understand what he's doing actually from the code. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I remember that Ahmed shared the yeah. paper with me, so you can also Google the some recent ah. uh, advances in this calculation of the real to imaginary uh, mm -hmm. parts. But we, we uh, like several years ago, we used some other uh, equations, and they were also doing quite well to smooth to the smooth data. So you first use smooth data with some I don't know splines or whatever to make it more stable, and then uh, use one or another. Yeah, I'm a bit worried about smoothing data because the real and budget parts, they must, you know, unless you use a smoothing splines that will obey the Hilbert transform relationship, you might be driving them away from 
uh, compatibility. Sure, sure, you have to be careful. But the, the, the thing what I, what I'm trying to put the stress on is that the dispersed relations they were they're not as you know widely used as they used to be used like 30 years ago when everything was 1D and uh, then now you should still like look and especially in the tipper data and as you show in your in some of your papers that tipper is especially vulnerable to some source effect distortion and whatever and before inserting them into the inversion code you better at least check the yeah check the consistency and if some parts yeah, of yeah. the curve is inconsistent you better not insert it yeah i'm talking about the land and tipper data in the in the um if you may measure it somewhere close to the shore and uh, on the sea bottom they should not be valid all these relations so there are some tools how to overcome it but uh may i speak alan sure sure, sure. yeah please yeah. so uh i was driving i couldn't join the talk so uh this this uh, phase out of quadrant issue, uh, it's something Leo is very hot about. And every Monday or whenever he comes to the office, he is talking about this because we, Phoenix is the first one blamed about this. They people <laughs> uh, like a noise instead of an anomaly. So I was recently trying to reproduce this phase rollout of quadrant issue, and uh, the paper. Stephen was uh, Stephen was showing is the one of the easiest models we can reproduce the PR uh, or Q uh, and which is also can be recovered with MODIM because MODIM can produce it. But there are lots of real data, uh, real case uh, cases which we cannot uh, resolve with three D immersion. Uh, and at that point, I'm agree with you. It is coming from the galvanic distortion. And I think Max and Anna's code is the only one we can uh, consider the uh, galvanic distortion for 3D immersion. I think we need to make uh, different groups of these anomalies and uh, find a particular solution by using these different codes because yes, if I can uh, model it, uh, I can calculate it with forward modeling, I can kind of uh, invert it with the same code. But if I cannot, the, this, uh, the reason of this anomaly is quite different. I'm done. Uh, you are muted, Alan. Sorry, I just got an email from Max. Unfortunately, he can't join us right now. But uh, quickly to mention, uh, because I see Randy's on the line. <laughs> Uh, that uh, Randy's code also will allow galvanic distortion. Um, and uh, we're, we're having some success at reproducing some of the proc effects that we're seeing using that code. Yeah, Alan, we, we you know, the problem is, of course, the, the our code is, um, not generally is not freely available to people it's you know supported by the company and we use it but you're right and th there's a lot of our internal work where we're able to reproduce the uh, phases out of quadrant but of course these are projects with companies and we they don't like us publishing those results we can't always do it but a lot of the times we can so mm -hmm. i think randy well well while we are talking about GeoTools, I don't think everybody in academia knows that uh, GeoTools is available to academia. The, uh, not, not the 3D part, but the rest, uh, the rest of the code is available. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's available for a very modest, yeah. I don't even know what it is. Uh, it's a very modest fee for academics. So yeah, uh, at least compared to, uh, for uh, industrial clients. Yeah. I have a question then, Randall, why, why are you there? 
when you when you do this, when you do have a data set, and let's just say it's an industrial data set, let's say you have 200 sites, you know, grids maybe and profiles, you do see phases of the quadrant. What's your approach in the modeling, having uh, the you know inverted core distortion as well available, on how you tackle that? I mean, do you do you just run it without? Inverting for distortion first, or how, what's what, what's your approach there? Because it is quite new, and people are just trying to get to grips on how to do it. So Alan, Alan was asking me about my catechism for three D inversion the other day. I'm not sure I have one. Um, you know, and uh, Alan was talking about in two D people. You know, every, everyone does two D approaches two D differently. But you know, there it's a little trickier. Uh, what you identify as TETM and whether you invert you know, TE amplitudes and things like that. I guess in 3D, I'm not sure I have a particular catechism, but we, 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 we um, would, we, I, I guess we, we generally would, would turn on distortion and version for distortion when we invert MT data just um, is a general rule, but we, I think we also try it without, because I mean, inversion, you know, there's no right answer and I always you know I always say inversion is an art form and you you know you, you have to kind of understand your data and what your data are telling you right mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. different parts and inverting for distortion there's nothing magical about it we we just followed the good work of, of Anna but it's still they're, they're just model parameters and the inversion is trying to minimize some objective function sure. right that doesn't mean the, the, the distortion that comes out of it is I, I, I mean, is it real? Is it based on, you know, so those, that's just a model that, that, that when you invert for those parameters, the, um, your optimization algorithm is able to, to, to get a, a decent data misfit. Um, so, you know, I think you, you, you have to, uh, you know, I, I always tell people, you have to look at the, the model, you have to look at predicted data and see if it all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Too many people just take what comes out of the the inversion and you know sort of, sort of treat it like a black box, which can be kind of dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think I might just rephrase it a bit. Uh, I I totally understand what you're saying. This was more in in relation to the discussion we just had that if you have phases out of quadrant, um, you could assume that your data is more distorted. So that means if you turn on the, you know, solving for, because you, you can set in the inversion parameter and tutorials of how much you want to solve for distortion. Right. I'm just wondering if you found that you had to solve more or push it more towards, you know, fitting or inverting for your distortion in these cases, or is that you can't really generally say that? Well, I can't say that because I'm not as involved in, in inverting right. data as like, you know, other people in our group Wolfgang or others. Uh, are yeah. are involved, so I I, yeah, okay. I I really can't tell you. No worries. But so some year when we had our first three uh, D MT inversion workshop, Laus Patterson came along uh, in uh, Dublin, and he 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 commented something that reminds me of something Nigel Edwards said when I first landed into Toronto as a postdoc in 1982, and Nigel Edwards said, "I don't know why you're bothering with induction." because it only lasts for a short frequency band, you should look more at galvanic effects because they last at all frequencies once you've got the charges imposed on the boundary. Mm. And, uh, and Laus Pedersen said this, he said that his approach to, to the inversion was actually to fit the galvanic effects first and then model the inductive effects. And, have and to I try guess, that out. <laughs> I guess we 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 always have to keep in mind that when we talk about distortion parameters, what we what we what that's an expression of is our inadequacy at modeling the Earth on the scale of the lateral heterogeneity in the Earth. If if we could model with cells, you know, electrode size wide around the electrode then we'd, we'd model these charges properly, right? And mm. if we went to high enough frequencies, we'd model the inductive and galvanic effects properly, but we can't because we have the frequencies are too low, the cells are too large, 
and uh, and we model the electric field as a point source rather than a, as a over an electrode span. And so, so in order to compensate for this, we we use these distortion parameters. There's a following up on that. I mean, there's two different issues, right? I mean, there's that issue of small scale galvanic distorters near the surface, which and if you don't invert for distortion, um, you you know the the inversion tries to accommodate that by putting in you know sharp changes uh, nearby uh, locally, but then okay, so but the, the phases rolling out a quadrant have been shown just here to be perfectly explainable by real 3D structure. But so I would say that's not a distortion. That's that's just mm -hmm. 3D. That's just 3D. Yeah. That's yeah. just the real. Mm -hmm. So that's a, so there are two different scales. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's distorting what we normally would consider re, uh, good data, but that's distorted by, by real 3D structure, not a local. Uh, so there's a couple of different types of distortion, I would say. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think you were in right at the beginning, Randy. But no, we were... no, I wasn't able to join it until just. Yeah. Well, talking about the BC87 data set, I was mentioning that I was able to model that using ModEM, and I was able to get something that approached the phase roll out of quadrant, but the, the resulting conductivity model made no geological sense. It was kind of like a corkscrew, it was a conductive corkscrew. Uh, and so, it, Yes, I could find a model, but it didn't make sense. And so I, that, that's leading me to think that there's more happening in the earth than we're able to model, possibly with a, an isotropic code. Um, and that we saw a strong phase roll out quadrant in, in anisotropy in the 2D case with the heistrom Pauss uh, paper. The earth is complicated, Alan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a wonderful story. Um, Alan, Alan Cook uh, opened the uh, first EM induction workshop. And I think you might find it in, in his introductory paper. In the, and he talked about a mathematician that made a model of the moon. And he, he fell so much in love with his model of the moon, he forgot what the moon looked like. <laughs> I'll see, I'll see if I can find that. Okay. Uh, next points, next questions. I think we've, I think there's some really good points come out of there. Alan, can I, um, this is a novice in MT, but just a question uh, quickly about uh, <clears throat> measuring this. Is there, Something in the field, the way you measure MT, that you could do different that uh, might uh, prove better answers? Well, I'm not sure you're going to get the answer from MT. I think you might have to go to a control source EM. Okay. A large Thank scale you. control source EM, so that you're generating not only uh, toroidal fields, but poloidal fields as well. Yeah, MT is mostly horizontally horizontal fields, right? So, I think it, to to really understand anisotropy, you you might want, and as we've discussed a few times, you might want to get vertical fields. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that was topic one. <laughs> We've been an hour on that, but we touched, touched a lot of others. Okay, one, one topic I'd like to, to discuss, and particularly with Lindsay on the line is, and, um, and Randy, is, is trying to generate realistic geological models. And unfortunately, uh, Jim Craven's not with us because they, they, they're working on an approach um, to try and understand, to try and get models that look more like geology, especially in in mining environments, you know, our, our approach of smoothest model isn't the best when you have focused, concentrated conductive structures. 
and it's, it's how to how how can we move that forward Lindsay that's an easy question <laughs> um no big question and I think um a really exciting one some of the things that perhaps come to mind well I mean there's been work of course done on um you know the use of sparse and compact norms um, so to be able to try and generate more compact structures is an interesting approach. I mean, it's challenging, especially when you go to EM, because not only then is your forward problem nonlinear, now you're introducing a nonlinear regularization. And so there's lots of places for, for an inversion to get stuck. Um, but I quite liked some of the work that um, Dom Fournier, so he's he's led a lot of the work um, on the use of sparse and compact norms in the context primarily of potential fields. Um, but it was one of the papers he published, and I'll, I can dig it up afterwards, um, is the use of different norms can be a really nice way to kind of explore the model space, is basically to combine different norms on your smallness and, and smoothness terms and just run a suite of inversions. And it at least can start to give you a flavor of, you know, what are what are some of the different models that all respect the data? And so it's um, I, I like it as a way to explore the model space without going to, you know, to a full sort of Bayesian style approach where now we need to be running, you know, tons and tons of forward simulations. Um, but I think this question also touches on, you know, the importance of physical properties and bringing a priori information into the inversion is that physical properties are really the connection point between geology and, and what we can do. And so if that, if that data and that information is available, that really opens up, um, a, a lot of opportunities, I think, um, and Thibault's work is, is, you know, uh, one example, Thibault Astic is, um, he did work on, you know, including um, petrophysical information in the inversion and trying to kind of cluster around where you expect physical properties to um, to be representative of rock units. So those are a couple of things that are are certainly quite interesting. But I think physical properties is is a space where um, it would be useful to have that information. And it's a challenging question because you know if you think about taking a sample uh, and and you know measuring on a, on a small uh, hand sample, that's very different than what we're actually seeing on the scale of of MT or any large uh, geophysical survey. Uh, Lindsay, can you expand on that a bit? What's what's the because this question is being asked in the Australian environment as well. There are a lot of drill holes, um, but they're obviously, you, know, you just have a point sample of the earth and then you do your big EM surveys or other type of geophysical surveys that spread a much larger area. Do you, do you have good examples of, of that where you do go out, um, you know, from the borehole into a, let's say, a 3D model that you have to constrain? Are there, are there good examples in, in Canada? That's a good question. I would need to do some digging to think about are there good examples, but I think some of the questions that are really interesting um, with respect to the this upscaling problem in a sense of if you've got a borehole information mm -hmm. that's a very different scale than um, yeah. core scale information. And um, there was a PhD student at UBC, uh, Luz and uh, Angelica Cadillo Mata. Cadillo Mata is her last name. Mm -hmm. um, and she was working with Eldad. And um, one of the things that we did that was makes a lot of sense kind of in, in hindsight. But if you think about, so let's just think about, you know, interbedded conductive and resistive layers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you think about a plane wave source, we're primarily going to see inductive effects. So we primarily mm -hmm. sample that like rock package as um, you're going to be biased towards seeing the conductive units. Whereas if mm -hmm. you think about a, a grounded source, we're going to see primarily the resistive units. Yeah. Um, and so the way we are sampling the earth really depends on the sensitivity function like of the physics we're using to, to sample. And so mm -hmm. with that in mind, I think then you can start to think about, okay, if we have this information, you know, at least you can perhaps get yourself in the right ballpark of, yeah. of where you expect uh, where you expect physical properties to lie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I think unfortunate from my limited experience in the in the in industry over the last years is that you know a survey is done, we produce our models, we give them to the client. 
And then the drillers come in and every single drill hole gives information and we could go back and reinvert with constraints, but we never asked to. Mm. And I, I keep telling clients this, I keep saying, look, you know, we can redo the inversion now and we can hold something constant. You've got, you've got information down the hole, we can hold that constant and redo the inversion. It'll cost you an extra 5,000 or something because we've got most of the model done already. And they never go for it. They just want to go and spend another 500,000 for another drill hole. <laughs> Well, it's this Pareto principle, isn't it? When they get 90% of the answer with the work that you've done. And um, the rest is just a bit too much time for them, probably. I don't know. But no, I, I've, heard of, I've heard this problem before. I, I, I got asked to look at some, some um, data and a model some years ago by a client. And the client was about to undertake a $5 million drill program and uh, I, won't, I won't say who collected the data and did the, the model, but I, I went through the data carefully and I found some problems with some of the data. And I took those data out and remodeled it. And when I remodeled it, the anomaly they were going to drill on disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so I, I said this to the client and the client canceled the drill program. So I, I either saved that company $5 million or I lost them 500 million. I'm not sure which. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've been running an hour and I think we're kind of drying up here, yeah? Is that... um, just, just have a look at the chat. There's actually a There's pretty a question. substantial. Yeah, yeah. An isotropy? No. It's to do with groundwater, but I think oh, Zubida has put in a lot of, yeah, um, Zubida. lot of effort into it. Yeah, I'll just I'll read this out so it gets into the. Uh, yeah. Unless uh, unless you want to come online, uh, Zubida, and, and make your point yourself, I can read it out. <clears throat> no, uh, Zubida's asking about the use of MT for groundwater. Uh, groundwater uses. Uh, Assessment. Oh, uh, Zabida is apologizing. Uh, internet is too slow. Um, I use electrical methods. We have a project in Sahara. Uh, the idea is to assess groundwater level fluctuation over time. Due to pumping, we conducted some vertical electric soundings in the study area. We planned MT in November. I was wondering if you had any advice on how to properly conduct these measurements to get the best outcome possible. And I have some other questions. How can MT be used to map and characterize subsurface geological features that impact groundwater flow and storage? How can MT be integrated with other geophysical methods to enhance groundwater exploration? What are the challenges in interpreting MT data for groundwater source? Uh, so Sabita, if you, if you can hear this, can you please put in how deep your groundwater level is fluctuating between like, is it just a few meters? Is it a hundred meters? What, what, what's the depth? Because that, that is pretty important to know. I think one, one really important thing when you do these time-lapse measurements <laughs> is, is to make sure that the electrodes are in exactly the same place in exactly the same conditions. Oh, the fluctuations are a few meters, uh, as would be to say. And so, you know, you really, the best thing to do is to, is actually to, to drill down 10 meters perhaps and put your electrode down and, and case it in uh, so that uh, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get thermal variation, you're not gonna get chemical variation, especially if you're looking at very small scale differences in your uh, MT responses. You don't want those to be just due to you know, different electrode locations or different electrode conditions. 
Is that going to be a problem, Ellen, if you, uh, I like the idea of, of putting electrodes down the hole, but if the, if the groundwater level is, let's say, you know, 10 or 20 meters, yeah, yeah, yeah. does it matter when the, the electrodes are not on the same level as your magnetometers at the surface? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it shouldn't. I mean, these, these, these codes should allow us to measure, to model what we really measure, which is a potential difference. So if you could go into the code and, and, and say, okay, I've got one electrode at this depth and one electrode at that depth, and the code now calculate what the potential difference is between these. There's been a, a huge amount of groundwater stuff done in um, in the Andes. I know this, and it's because of the the need for water for um, um, mine processing. Uh, I know Karen Christofferson has been involved in a thousands and thousands of sites for uh, for groundwater problems in in South America. Okay. <coughs> so Sergio is asking, uh, we all know Archie's law in relation to porosity and porosity content. Is there something similar in relation to fracturing, fracturing density and fracturing orientation? So this would be second order porosity rather than first order porosity. Uh, yeah, there is. Um, I mean, maybe fracturing is not the right word, it's more permeability, uh, but it's related to the fracturing and the density and the connectivity. Uh, there's been some really nice work done by Alison Kirby. Um, she's now in New Zealand doing geothermal work, not even MT related, but she was at Geoscience Australia and did a PhD at the University of Adelaide. And she looked at uh, sort of resistor networks. Um, and permeability studies and what influence that has on MT responses. And I'll dig it up and put it in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do that now. Okay, everyone, well, I think uh, we're probably done. Thanks everyone, this has been great. And uh, from Lindsay and, and Stefan, Sasha, uh, who couldn't make it because it's, yeah, it's what time or whatever time it is in Australia. <coughs> and Max and Juliana, <laughs> the new team, we look forward to seeing you all for season four and be great to get some talks. Maybe from um, Phoenix on phase rollout quadrant. The solution, there you, there you go. I got a title for you already, Jan. Phase rollout quadrant, the solution. The solution. <laughs> Just measure more data. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody, and uh, see you in October. Bye. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. See ya. Thank you. Bye.